Radio A1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, we have a report on the big winners at Sunday night's Academy Awards, or Oscars, ceremony. Later, Mario Ritter Jr. presents this week's Health and Lifestyle Report. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. History series. But first... Everything Everywhere All at Once won the Best Picture Oscar at the Academy Awards Ceremony Sunday night in Los Angeles, California. The unusual movie about a Chinese-American immigrant family won seven Oscars, including three acting awards for Michelle Yeoh, Kei Hui Kwan, and Jamie Lee Curtis. The Malaysian-born Yeoh became the first Asian woman to win a Best Actress Oscar. In the film, she plays the laundromat owner with superpowers in a different universe. For all the little boys and girls who look like me watching tonight, this is a beacon of hope and possibilities, the 60-year-old actress said. And ladies, don't let anybody ever tell you you're past your prime, Yo added. As a boy, Quan starred in the 1984 Indiana Jones movie and The Goonies in 1985. The 51-year-old said he quit acting for many years because he saw too few opportunities for Asian actors. On Sunday night, Quan won the Best Supporting Actor Oscar. In the film, he plays Yeo's husband. Quan, who was born in Vietnam, cried as he gave his speech Sunday. He said, My journey started on a boat. I spent a year in a refugee camp. Somehow, I ended up here, on Hollywood's biggest stage. They say stories like this only happen in the movies, he added. I cannot believe it's happening to me. This is the American dream. The 64-year-old Curtis won Best Supporting Actress for her role as the tax agent in Everything Everywhere All at Once. In her speech, Curtis looked upward and addressed her parents, Academy Award nominees Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. Both of her parents have passed away. I just won an Oscar, Curtis told them. Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert together won Best Director and Best Original Screenplay. Everything Everywhere All at Once was made with a small $14.3 million budget and has brought in more than $100 million so far. The fourth acting award went to Brendan Fraser, who won Best Actor for his work in The Whale. In the film, he plays an extremely overweight man trying to reconnect with his daughter. A German remake of the World War I story, All Quiet on the Western Front, was named Best International Feature Film. The movie, which streamed on Netflix, shows the horrors of war through the eyes of a young man. The movie also won Oscars for music, production design, and cinematography. Director Edward Berger thanked the film's young star, Felix Kammerer, who joined him on stage. This was your first movie, and you carried us on your shoulders as if it was nothing, Berger said. Navalny, 
won the Oscar for Best Feature Documentary. The movie is about Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who was nearly killed by poison and has been jailed since his 2021 return to Moscow. Alexei, I am dreaming of the day when you will be free and our country will be free, his wife, Yulia Navalnaya, said at the award presentation. Stay strong, my love. Natu Natu, the song from the Indian movie RRR that created a viral dance, earned an Oscar for Best Original Song. The recent kidnapping of four Americans in Mexico brought attention to a common practice for many people in the United States, medical tourism. Medical tourism is traveling to other countries to receive medical care that is not available or too costly at home. The four Americans were caught in a shootout between criminal drug organizations. Two were killed, and two were held in a remote area of Mexico. A family member said, The four were on a trip from the U.S. so that one of them could get cosmetic surgery from a doctor in Matamoros. Experts say people leave the U.S. to get many medical procedures. These include cosmetic surgery, dental care, cancer treatments, and buying medicines. Lydia Gann is an economist at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. She said, Medical tourism has been growing in popularity for years. This kind of travel is popular with people who have no health insurance or health plans that require them to pay thousands of dollars in additional costs. Sometimes companies send people covered by their insurance to other countries, for medical procedures like hip or knee replacements. Some companies also send people to Mexico for less costly medicines. Jonathan Edelheit is head of the Medical Tourism Association, an industry trade group. He told the Associated Press that medical care costs in countries like Mexico can be more than 50% lower than in the U.S. Also, cosmetic surgeries that cost thousands of dollars are largely not covered by U.S. health insurers. Patients sometimes travel because they can get quick care outside the U.S. They also might want to seek treatment from a doctor who speaks their language or comes from the same culture. Medical Tourism Magazine, the trade group's publication, said over $37 billion was spent on medical tourism in 2019 around the world. Besides Mexico, the publication said the top five countries for medical tourism are Canada, Singapore, Japan, Spain, and Britain. Other places include Dubai, Costa Rica, Israel, Abu Dhabi, and India. In 2019, the city-state of Singapore received more than 500,000 foreign visitors 
for its less costly and high-quality health care. For example, heart bypass surgery could cost $140,000 in the U.S. compared to $25,000 in Singapore. In Spain, the average cost of cosmetic surgery, such as a facelift, could be $5,000 instead of $15,000 in the U.S. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, says millions of people from the U.S. travel to other countries for care each year. Researcher Arturo Bustamante estimates that 400,000 people traveled from the U.S. to Mexico each year for care before COVID-19 appeared. The University of California, Los Angeles, health policy professor said, most of the people visiting Mexico for care are Mexican or Latino immigrants living in the U.S. He said non-Latino patients mainly cross the border to get treatment for their teeth, buy prescription drugs, or to receive cosmetic surgery or some cancer treatments not covered in the U.S. However, the CDC warns medical tourism could be risky depending on the country and the medical center. Among the risks, the health agency says, are infectious diseases, quality of care, language difficulties, and follow-up care. To reduce risks, the CDC advises people to work with a health care provider or travel medicine provider before making the trip. Lydia Gann of North Carolina noted, that care providers often have someone pick patients up at the airport and take them to the health center or hotel. The CDC says patients should research health care providers and health centers. Edelheit of the American Tourism Association added that patients should research care quality before considering prices. They really need to make sure they are going with the best of the best, he said. Once patients choose a country and provider, the CDC advises to bring medical records and to inform medical workers of any health problems. After a procedure, the agency says to get copies of all new medical records, and to plan for follow-up care. The risk for patients may not end after a procedure. If someone has medical problems after returning home, it may be hard for their doctor to learn the details about the care received during a trip. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. You just heard this week's Health and Lifestyle Report, presented by Mario Ritter, Jr. Mario joins me now to talk more about the story. Hi, Mario. Hi, Ashley. It's a pleasure to be here. Our listeners probably understand tourism to be travel for fun to interesting and new places. So how is it that the term medical tourism came about? That's a really good question, Ashley. We usually think of tourism as recreation and 
medical operations are anything but recreation. But for people writing about the practice, tourism means travel, not necessarily fun. So traveling for a medical operation or treatment came to be called medical tourism. Following up on that idea, the Medical Tourism Association warns there are a lot of things that people should watch out for if they get involved in traveling to other countries to get medical treatments, especially forms of cosmetic surgery. Those are operations meant to improve one's appearance and are not for medical problems. Yes, Ashley. The CDC warns that infectious diseases, the quality of the medical care, and possible misunderstandings caused by language differences can be real problems. A lot of people travel for medical treatments to save money, but there are longer-term issues, including follow-up care, that might influence the true cost over time. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today, Mario. You're welcome, Ashley. It's always nice to be on your show. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. There was one main issue in America's presidential election of 1916. That issue was war. Europe was in the middle of what is now remembered as World War I. It was the bloodiest conflict the world has ever known. Most Americans wanted no part of the struggle in Europe. They supported their country's official position, neutrality. This desire was the main reason President Woodrow Wilson won re-election. People gave Wilson their votes because they hoped he would continue to keep America out of the war. Larry West and Morris Joyce tell more about the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. Like most Americans, Woodrow Wilson did not want war. He feared that entering the conflict would cost the United States many lives. Wilson read the reports from European battlefields. The news was unbelievably terrible. By the end of 1916, Several million men had been killed, wounded, or captured. At the Battle of Verdun, French forces stopped a German attack. The cost was high on both sides. More than 700,000 soldiers were killed, wounded, or captured. The Battle of the Somme followed. Britain lost 60,000 men on the first day. By the time the battle was over, losses for both sides totaled more than a million. Germany also was at war on its eastern border with Russia. Losses on that battlefront, too, totaled more than a million men. At the time of America's presidential election in 1916, Germany seemed to be winning the war. Its losses were terrible. But the losses of its enemies, the Allies, were even worse. German forces occupied much of northern France and almost all of Belgium. German and Austrian soldiers also held parts of Russia, Italy, Romania, and Serbia. Germany was winning on the battlefield. 
the Allies were winning at sea. A British blockade cut off almost all German trade with the rest of the world. Even food shipments were blocked. As a result, Germany faced mass starvation. It urgently needed to break the blockade and get food. This situation finally forced Germany to make the decision that would bring the United States into the war. It decided to use its submarines to break the British blockade. The submarines would attack any ships that came near Britain or other parts of Europe. This included ships from neutral countries, like the United States. Earlier, Germany had made a promise to the United States. Its submarines would not attack civilian ships unless warning was given and the lives of those on the ships were saved. Now Germany was withdrawing that promise. It said unrestricted submarine warfare would begin immediately. German ruler Kaiser Wilhelm said, If Wilson wants war, let him make it, and let him then have it. President Wilson immediately broke diplomatic relations with Germany. He still hoped the two nations would not go to war. He left that decision to Germany. If German submarines sank American ships, Wilson would have no choice but to declare war. Most American shipping companies feared attack by German submarines. Throughout the early part of 1917, they kept their ships in home ports. They wanted protection. So they asked for permission to arm their ships. At first, President Wilson refused to seek such permission from Congress. He did not want to do anything that might cause Germany to declare war. Then he received secret news from Britain. British agents had gotten a copy of a telegram from Germany's foreign minister to Germany's ambassador in Mexico. The telegram said Germany was planning hostile acts against the United States. Wilson acted quickly. He began putting guns and sailors on American trade ships. It did not take long for the worst to happen. Within days, a German submarine sank an unarmed American ship, the Algonquin. Then three more American ships were sunk. Many lives were lost. President Wilson no longer had a choice between war and peace. There would be war. Wilson called a special session of Congress. Members of both the Senate and House of Representatives gathered in one room. They stood as the President walked quickly to the front. He stood silent for a moment before speaking. This is what he said. Fully understanding the serious step I am taking, I advise that the Congress declare the recent acts of the German government to be, in fact, nothing less than war against the United States. 
It is a fearful thing to lead this great, peaceful people into war. But right is more precious than peace. And we will fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the rights and liberties of small nations, and for the belief that a worldwide union of free people can bring peace and safety to all nations. President Wilson's emotional speech brought tears to the eyes of many of the lawmakers. They felt the great seriousness of his request. Outside, crowds lined the street to cheer Wilson as he returned to the White House from the Capitol building. He sat in his car and shook his head sadly. Think of what it is they are cheering, he said. My message today was a message of death for our young men. How strange it seems they would cheer that. On April 6, 1917, Congress approved a declaration of war against Germany. The Allies, Britain, France, and Russia, welcomed American involvement. The war was going badly for them. It had been very costly in lives, money, and supplies. Allied shipping was suffering heavy losses from German submarine attacks. A British naval blockade had greatly reduced food shipments to Germany. Now, Britain itself faced dangerously low supplies of food. Allied representatives went to Washington to explain what the Allies needed. They needed supplies, especially food, immediately. They needed money to pay for the supplies. They needed ships to get the supplies from America to Europe, and they needed American soldiers. President Wilson and Congress worked together to organize the United States for war. Congress gave Wilson new wartime powers. He soon formed a council to build ships, improve industrial production, and control national transportation. He formed an agricultural agency to increase food production and food exports and he formed an information committee to build public support for the war. Wilson's efforts succeeded. The Allies quickly got the ships, supplies, and money they requested. Most important, they soon got American soldiers. Allied military leaders said only about half million troops were needed from the United States. But American officials decided to build a much larger army. Before long, large numbers of American soldiers were crossing the Atlantic Ocean. They would fight the Germans at the western battlefronts of Europe. The extra strength they gave the Allies would play a major part in helping defeat Germany. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. 
And I'm Dan Novak. 